Good morning. Um, my name is Rachel Shield. I'm the Director of Engagement here at Westminster Presbyterian Church. We are seeing some of our participants filter in a little late as our early service went a little long. But for the sake of our live stream audience, I think I'll begin introductions and announcements so that we're on schedule and can hear as much from our speaker today as possible. Feel free to um, find a spot and uh, we're happy you're here. Um, a couple things. Um, we are really excited uh, to have Melissa Bora here today. Um, I just want to kind of put in a final announcement for some of our fall small groups that are beginning. We have got um, a new one that has been identified that's focusing on downtown um, fellowship in particular. So there's some couples and some singles who live downtown and are going to be meeting regularly for fellowship, uh, prayer, et cetera. If you're interested in being part of that group, let me know and I'm happy to make the connection. Um, here, okay, I went away from my notes, but um, this is Dr. Melissa Borja. She is from the University of Michigan, but she actually did research here in the Twin Cities on Hmong refugee resettlement um, and the role of churches in that resettlement. So when we originally talked with her about speaking, we had no idea that the situation in Afghanistan would be what it was and that we would have the opportunity to engage the issue again so directly. We actually have uh, about 20 folks from Westminster who are part of a team that is accompanying um, a mother and her four teenage sons who are uh, being resettled here in the Twin Cities area. And it's really our honor and privilege to be able to walk alongside them as they uh, come into their new community and get settled. So I am excited about that team. I know that team is excited to be doing the work that they are doing. Um, if you are interested in learning more about that, I have the names of those team members and I would be happy to share them with you. Um, so here we go. Dr. Melissa Borja um, is a core faculty member in the Asian Pacific Islander American Studies program, earned a PhD and M uh, Master's of Philosophy and History from Columbia, and in addition to an MA in History from the University of Chicago and uh, an AB in History from Harvard University. Before teaching at the University of Michigan, she was assistant professor in the Department of History at the College of Staten Island. So her research is in migration, religion, politics, race, race and ethnicity in the United States and the Pacific world with special attention to how Asian American religious beliefs and practices have developed in the context of pluralism, migration, and the modern American state. So we're excited to learn from her. I'm excited to hear about how we can translate what happened in previous uh, migration waves to the new uh, waves of migration we're experiencing now. Thanks so much for being with us. We're glad you're here. Thank you so much. And I'm going to stop sharing my video just for a moment as I introduce myself a little bit more. Um, so I have been working on a book on refugee resettlement for almost two decades. And I spent a lot of time between 2010 and about 2013 in St. Paul and Minneapolis doing work on understanding how uh, congregations in the Twin Cities were involved in Hmong refugee resettlement in the 1970s, 80s, um, and also 90s. So little did I know that 10 years later, just as I'm putting the final touches on a book on this topic, uh, and I should mention that the research I was doing about a decade ago was for my dissertation, which is now going to be a book published by Harvard University Press, uh, that I didn't know that Afghanistan would fall. And I didn't know that the work I would be doing would suddenly be so relevant. To be perfectly honest, I wish my work were never relevant in this way, um, but here we are. So it is a blessing to be able to talk with you all today, to share with you all what I have learned about the religious dimensions of congregational sponsorship and broadly refugee work I should also just share personally, this is work I am involved in in my own life outside of my work as a professor. So after I speak with you, I'm gonna be going to my own church and talking with people in my own community about working with an Afghan family that's going to be resettling. Uh, so I actually teach at the Michigan, the University of Michigan, but I live in Indiana, specifically Indianapolis. And Indiana has Camp Atterbury where a lot of Afghan evacuees have been staying uh, and so there's a lot of activity on this 
uh, front here in Indiana where I live and I'm doing this work myself, walking alongside you, trying to apply as many lessons that I've learned from the past to the work I'm doing in the present. One final thing I, I should mention, I, in addition to working on this in a historical sense on Hmong refugee resettlement, I'm an advisor for a big project that is based at Princeton University and is in, done, done in collaboration with the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops. The USCCB's Migration and Refugee Service is one of the largest voluntary agencies involved in refugee resettlement in the United States. And over the past few years, we've been doing a ton of oral history interviews to understand the religious dimensions of refugee resettlement in the United States, interviewing a couple hundred people who come to the United States as refugees since the Second World War up through the present. So we have a number of oral history interviews specifically about Afghan um, experiences. I'm happy to share that in the chat and share that with the event organizers today. We have found that it's very powerful to build support in communities by helping people understand the very human experience of being forced to migrate, experiencing the challenges of resettlement. Um, and so we've used these oral histories very effectively in order to um, build the understanding that's critical for serving these communities well. So I'm, I'm happy to share that work with you that is ongoing. Okay, I'm going to share some slides. I, I am a professor and I, I think it can be very useful to, to share visuals. So I'm gonna share some slides right now and begin with a story. Well, first of all, I should mention that the title of my talk today is Ministering Refugee Resettlement. A lot of my research is about how refugee resettlement policies are administered. But what is really important to my mind is that religious institutions play a critical role in this work and view it as a ministry. So this work that I'm sharing with you today comes from the third chapter of my current book manuscript that's called Ministering Refugee Resettlement. And I can I bet you can see the connections between religious practice uh, and the implementation of policy in that title. Let me tell you a story, first of all. A story based on the experience of a woman named Marianne Lund. Now in the spring of 1975, just as the Vietnam had fallen to the communists, a woman named Marianne Lund arrived at Marine Corps Base Camp Pendleton in California, and she reported for duty. She was a pastor's wife, a volunteer with Lutheran Immigration and Refugee Service, and she was responding to a call by both her government and her church to aid refugees displaced by war in Southeast Asia. And at Camp Pendleton, which was just north of San Diego, she was part of a large group of faith-filled volunteers who were doing the same thing, helping 100,000 Vietnamese refugees who had been airlifted across the Pacific and brought to temporary military sites at the United States that year. So in a letter that she wrote, excuse me, an article that she wrote for LIRS Bulletin, she described the work of refugee resettlement as an exhilarating religious awakening. Now, until she had arrived at Camp Pendleton, she said that she and her husband had wondered, what does, what does Christ look like? This is a question that she posed explicitly. And she said that it was in the refugees that she and her husband, quote, saw the face of Christ. For the Luns, the daily work of feeding the hungry and comforting the grief-stricken was a holy encounter with Jesus. Working at Camp Pendleton for Lund was an opportunity to follow Jesus's teachings. She quoted often from Matthew 25 and described the biblical basis for her work with refugees. When she served meals, and washed the clothing of refugees. She explained that she was honoring verse 35 and 36. I was hungry and you gave me food, naked and you clothed me. When she spent time with the people who were living in the prison-like conditions at Camp Pendleton, where a field of tents housed huddled masses yearning to be free, she acted on the call to show mercy to the lonely and unfree. I was in prison and you came to visit me. When she saw the gratitude of refugees, who were sponsored and resettled by Lutheran congregations across the country, she lived out the call for Christian hospitality. I was a stranger and you took me in. 
Now, Marianne Lund wrote about her story, hoping that it would encourage other Lutherans and other Christians to contribute to the resettlement effort. And in making her case, she echoed the arguments made by government officials promoting refugee sponsorship as an opportunity to help refugees achieve self-sufficiency. She said that sponsors would provide for the uh, prisoner's needs until he or she could stand alone, self-supporting and truly free. But for Lund, the message centered primarily on presenting refugee care as an act of religious ministry. You are the ones who can minister to these Christs through our love and assistance, she said. A thrilling experience awaits you as you share your gifts from the hand of a loving father with others of his creation. You are his hands and heart in ministry, in Holy Spirit, that lives and moves to call, gather, enlighten, and sanctify. Refugee resettlement for Marianne Lund was not simply an opportunity for Christians to share their gifts with refugees. Rather, refugees themselves were gifts to Christians, she said. Christ ministered to me through these people. Now, I share this story because I think it's a really powerful, articulate um, expression of how so many people of faith, and I focused on a Lutheran woman, but many people of faith, drew on religious teachings, and it was those religious commitments that motivated them to get involved with serving refugees in the wake of the Vietnam War. So today, I'm going to talk about those religious commitments, and I have a few main ideas, five main ideas. I outlined them here just to give you a template of what lies ahead. My first point is to talk about the structure of refugee resettlement in the United States. In the United States, refugee resettlement really runs on the contributions of private agencies and institutions, especially religious institutions. And this has been true throughout the full history of U.S. refugee resettlement, even as the context of religious diversity and refugee demographics has changed. My second, and I would say probably the most important point, is that this refugee work is an example of lived religion. And religious institutions and individuals have often pursued resettlement as an expression of their faith. Well, we know that religious people are very diverse. Christians are very diverse. And here, too, we see Christians approaching the ministry of refugee resettlement in a variety of ways. So how they did refugee work um, can really vary. And these differences in approaches had a really big impact on refugees' lives, um, and refugees had very different experiences if they were sponsored by one group of Christians or another. So I will dwell on that um, towards the end. I'll conclude this talk with a few themes that I think will help inform our responses to refugees in the current moment. But most of my work today will be providing some historical context for refugee crises uh, in the 1970s and 80s, as well as in the current day. The first thing I want you to know is that the U.S. refugee resettlement system has long depended on the contributions of religious groups. Here is a snapshot of the voluntary agencies that were involved in Southeast Asian refugee resettlement in 1981, so roughly the midpoint of uh, the period of time when the United States was wealthy, welcoming about a million refugees from Southeast Asia. And I have done the work of identifying which voluntary agencies which have contracts with the federal government are religiously affiliated and which ones are not. So the ones that are red are ones that are religiously affiliated. And you can see here that the vast majority of refugees were resettled by voluntary agencies that had some sort of connection to um, a, uh, a religious community or denomination. So the main ones are the U.S. Catholic Conference, which is now the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops Migration and Refugee Service, Church World Service, um, which is associated with the National Council of Churches, the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society, the Lutheran Immigration and Refugee Service, World Relief Refugee Service, which is associated with the National Association of Evangelicals, the Young Men's Christian Association, and the Buddhist Council for Refugee Rescue and Resettlement. So you can see which um, institutions 
played the biggest role in 1981, but what you should know is that this was pretty consistent over the two decade period that was the focus of my study. Um, and I actually began my study in 1975, um, but the data is most consistent after the 1980 Refugee Act. So this is the last two decades of the 20th century. And you can see once again, that re religious voluntary agencies handle the lion's share of um, cases of uh, refugees resettled in the United States in this two decade period. No big question is why? This is a very long history, but um, you should know that when Saigon fell and there was a big scramble to attend to the needs of refugees from Southeast Asia in the 1970s, the United States had already by that point relied on the contributions of religious institutions for decades. Um, even before the Second World War, uh, religious institutions were urging governments to respond to the needs of refugees and the historically the offer of admissions to the United States was contingent on the promise of effective resettlement domestically. So there's a very long history of the United States relying on uh, private agencies, especially religious agencies. There are lots of explanations. And I think if you're interested in this topic, um, there's a recent book um, called Send Them Here by Jeffrey Cameron that explains this very beautifully, um, as well as the book Benevolent Empire by Stephen Porter. But one thing you should know basically is that refugee resettlement takes a lot of time and takes a lot of money. It's very hard to do. And it's often beyond the capacity of the government to do on its own. So refugee resettlement is a public private enterprise in the United States um, because it is something that both groups are interested in and both groups are able to do more effectively when done in collaboration. At the very local level, one really critical way that refugee resettlement is a public, private, and I would say church state enterprise is that we see many congregations involved as sponsors of refugees. Um, so that is something that is happening now. It's happened for a long time. And it was a really big reason why many refugees were sent to different places. Hmong refugees were sent to Minnesota, for example, because that is where group sponsors were available, particularly congregational sponsors were available. Now, there are a lot of different ways people could be sponsored as a refugee in the United States. And in the 1970s, there were some people who were eager to, re to sponsor refugees as individuals. But refugee resettlement officials and government officials realized that it was much more efficacious to have group sponsorship. Because if you have a group taking care of a family of refugees, you have more resources. And there are uh, fewer challenges that could contribute to a breakdown in sponsorship. We also see during this period, many religious communities saying it is our religious responsibility to respond to the needs of refugees. So there is a lot of enthusiasm for refugee resettlement. I'll get to that in a moment. But I want to talk about at, at, at this point in time, uh, how congregations were seen as an important unit or um, tool for helping refugees be welcomed in the United States. And here I draw on the words of Ingrid Walter, who at the time in the 1970s was leading Lutheran Immigration Refugee Service. She said, it is our conviction that a congregation offers a diversity of resources that equip it well to assist the refugee to build a new life in this country <clears throat> and to help them become self-sufficient. Some members of the congregation will be best at meeting the immediate physical needs, providing temporary housing or assisting him to find employment. Others in the congregation will be best able to provide personal guidance in the many complicated facets of everyday life in the United States. Others will be best at providing the close emotional and spiritual support that will help the refugee become part of the community and give him a sense of being at home in a new land, while at the same time showing understanding for the refugee's culture. So if you can imagine all of the different people who have different talents and skills and resources, ways to share, ways to help in your congregation. Um, think about multiplying that over and over again. Um, and that is how refugee resettlement was often powered uh, at the local level is through people coming together as a group, often as a congregation and say, we're, we're gonna pool our resources and together we're going to support a family.
Now, one thing that is important to know about the history of refugee resettlement is that institutionally, a lot has stayed the same over the course of the second half of the 20th, 20th century and into the 21st century, but the demographics have changed quite a bit. In the 1940s, 50s, and 60s, you saw a lot of these agencies that I mentioned earlier, USCCB, LARS, um, Church World Service, they were often resettling co-ethnics and co-religionists. In other words, Lutherans were resettling other Lutherans, and Catholics were resettling other Catholics, Jews resettling other Jews. But that really changed in the 1960s and 70s as we began to see refugee populations uh, emerge because of war and other um, important events around the world. So it wasn't just coming from Europe. Um, and we also see um, a lot of concern and a lot of questions about how the U.S. resettlement system will respond to the fact that um, no longer would Lutherans be resettling fellow Lutherans. They might be resettling Buddhists and Muslims. So Ingrid Walter, whom I quoted in the earlier slide, reflected on this in her oral history interview in the 1980s. She said, you know, a lot changed in the 1970s because no longer were they resettling fellow Lutherans. Uh, they were resettling people who were not Lutheran and it involved a lot of learning. As she put it, it was a group of refugees rather than Lutheran refugees. So in the case of LIRS, they had a lot of involvement in the resettlement of Ugandan refugees, many of whom were Muslim and Hindu. They arrived in the early 1970s. And then that was prelude to the work they would do later in the 1970s and 1980s, resettling um, Southeast Asian refugees, many of whom were Buddhist and Catholic, um, but also uh, pra practitioners of other, um, other ways. So animism, um, ancestor worship, and more. So I can't underscore how important this is. Um, we see in the United States overall big demographic shifts in who's coming to the United States racially, ethnically, and religiously. Um, but it's really true for refugee resettlement. But what is an interesting thing to observe is to see how Christian organizations and individuals continue to be the centerpiece of how the United States responds to refugee crises um, at the same time that the refugee populations are changing racially, ethnically, and um, religiously. So now let's talk about how refugee work was um, pursued as a form of lived religion. Well, let me just explain the term lived religion and, and why it's significant to people like myself who study religion in the United States. There's a tendency often to talk about religion in terms of belief and in terms of identity. But what is um, increasingly important in the eyes of many religion scholars is to pay attention to how religion is practiced and religion is lived out. And so um, there is a term that people use uh, to describe this shift in framework. It's called focusing on lived religion. And um, one thing that I argue in my book is that refugee resettlement is um, an expression of lived religion, and in particular, um, very much a uh, way that people lived out commitments to the golden rule and biblical imperatives to welcome the stranger as um, you heard earlier in this talk. What I think is a really uh, a good example of this is uh, coming from a church world service pamphlet from the late 1970s. And you can see um, how refugee resettlement was framed as a form of religious service, specifically Christian service um, in this pamphlet. So at the top, it says churches, avenues of God's love to refugees. Um, and I'll read the text out loud. It says, refugees coming to the U.S. arrive here with very little to help them get started. Churches can help in the difficult process of beginning over again in a new land. Refugees need help with the practical aspects of life uh, in a new land, such as finding an apartment and getting a job. Churches can also provide help by extending the, their community to include refugees in the fellowship of the human family. This is my favorite paragraph. He says, they say, Jesus, who himself was a refugee, said that by helping refugees, we are really helping him. Will your church consider reaching out and helping a refugee begin a new life? In a camp many miles away, someone is waiting to hear from you. 
So I always call attention to this pamphlet because I think it, it does a couple things. The first is, once again, it reminds us that religion is something that people live out through their practices. It's not just a set of beliefs. But the second thing is it reminds us that um, refugee resettlement as uh, a system that was public and private, when it was enacted at the very local level, was often enacted with very religious commitments motivating it. Um, so there is a tendency to often think about voluntary agencies that have contracts with the federal government as operating just like any private agency. But the reality is that a lot of these voluntary agencies are faith-based and in making appeals to get congregations to support resettlement work at the local level, they talked about religious commitments. Um, and so we can't understand refugee resettlement and how it's administered and ministered at the local level without thinking about the religious commitments that motivated these forms of service. So what precisely did people say about why they decided to get involved with um, refugee resettlement at the local level um, and specifically congregational sponsorship? Well, as I said at the very beginning of my talk, we know that there are lots of different types of Christians in the world. And that's true also in Minnesota uh, and true in the Twin Cities. I'm gonna share examples from a couple congregations that I got to know when I was doing my work in the Twin Cities. And I think they exemplify two broad trends and approaches to refugee resettlement. The first is what I would describe as golden rule Christianity approach to refugee resettlement, um, in which refugee resettlement was a ministry. And then the second is what I would describe as the missionary approach to refugee resettlement. So I'll begin first with, with uh, what I think is honestly the most common um, approach to refugee resettlement that I observed in my work. And I should mention in, in my research, I did a lot of oral history interviews. I looked at um, congregational documents for dozens of congregations in the Twin Cities area. Um, it also looked at voluntary agency documents. So I had a, a lot of time with St. Anthony Park Lutheran Church in St. Paul. Um, and I spoke with a woman named Joanne Carvinen who was involved with their uh, refugee resettlement ministry for many years. And she's really interesting. She had a lot of different reasons she shared for why she became involved in refugee resettlement in the 1970s. Uh, one of the reasons she said was she really opposed the Vietnam War and she felt like helping refugees who were displaced by the Vietnam War was one, the least she could do to um, address the injustices that she had seen up until that point. Um, and she also talked about, in general, being interested in learning about other people. Um, and it was, in general, also very interested in, in work related to justice. But the most important thing for her was that refugee resettlement was a chance for her to live out the golden rule. So I um, will read a, an oral history quote from her. She says, well, I suppose the main reason is just, the, just following the tenet of love thy neighbor as thyself and following the example of Jesus Christ in working with the poor and working with children and working with the downtrodden. It just seems, you know, so obvious to us that this is what we must do, that here are these people that have no home. They have nothing. And in most cases, it's through no fault of their own. And so, of course, as a Christian, we would help them and help them in more than just materialistic ways. We would truly try to make them feel welcome and worthwhile in our society. So um, Joanne was not the only one who described uh, her work in refugee resettlement as a way of living out the golden rule and loving her neighbor. Um, for other people I interviewed who became involved in refugee programs later in the 1980s, for example, in volunteer programs to serve elderly people, um, they described it in terms of responding to the needs of a changing neighborhood in St. Paul. Uh, maybe they were part of a historically Swedish or Norwegian Lutheran church and they saw Hmong refugees resettling in their community that if I'm going to love my neighbor, I should really love my neighbor. And these are my new neighbors. So I should, so I should do things to help them feel welcome. So there are different ways that people understood what it means to live out the commitment to neighborly love. Now, I want to contrast this story um, with that of Pearl Jones, which is a pseudonym. Um, she's from Roseville Baptist Church. Now, Pearl Jones is really interesting because she growing up had always wanted to go overseas and be a missionary. 
and she didn't get a chance to do so, but one day was working as a secretary at Roseville Baptist Church when she received a phone call from somebody who asked for help in sponsoring a relative who at that point was in a refugee camp in Thailand. And she thought this was an amazing opportunity that was God-given uh, and providential. And she said um, that she she just felt called to say yes and called to uh, try to organize her congregation to support this person who had asked for their help. So in her view, the fact that she had never had a chance to go overseas and be a missionary, um, it was okay because God had actually brought the missionary work to her in Minnesota. And I always love quoting this line because I think it, it expresses that sentiment so, so well. She said, I never thought that God would pick up a whole people and move them to our country so we could do missions with them. So this is a very different approach to refugee resettlement, but also uh, very grounded in um, biblical commitments. So if uh, the golden rule Christians emphasized Matthew 25, uh, the Christians involved in refugee resettlement who were more like Pearl Jones uh, really emphasized the Great Commission and the call to make disciples of all nations. Um, and they really saw refugee resettlement as an opportunity to do missionary work in a domestic context. And I would say that this approach to refugee resettlement um, is often associated with people who were involved with um, World Relief, which is associated with the National Association of Evangelicals. So th these were people who tended to um, have a more literalist uh, approach to scripture. So there are a lot of things that they had in common, but they were really dead set on using refugee resettlement as an opportunity to uh, win souls, which is a word that Pearl Jones used. Now, this raises uh, a really kind of interesting point, and I think a, a delicate one, which is, well, what do you do when you have people like Pearl Jones um, encountering people who are not Christian and who are dependent on their care? Um, and so I would say broadly, after interviewing dozens of Hmong refugees who were sponsored by churches, um, Hmong refugees said that they were grateful for the assistance that they received. This was a universal message that they were um, thankful to have been able to be cared for, to show to have been shown so much love by the congregations who sponsored them. But there were a lot of stories of people saying that they um, sometimes felt uncomfortable about being brought to church and not wanting to go to church because they had their own religion or set of practices that they wanted to pursue. Mai Vang Tao, who did an oral history interview that's housed at the Minnesota Historical Society, put it this way. When I asked, when she was asked, why did you uh, go to church for seven or eight years? She said, when we arrived in this country, the Americans took us to church, so we went. It turned out that she didn't like it. She expressed her frustration with that. And after going to church for eight years, didn't go anymore because, as she put it bluntly, she didn't like it. Um, so this is, I think, an ongoing question. How do we manage the religious commitments of people who are doing refugee resettlement um, and the religious needs of the people who are being resettled uh, and the religious differences that might exist between them? Ellen Erickson, who in the 1990s was uh, working with Lutheran, Lutheran Social Service, which is the local affiliate of LIRS, um, emphasized in one article, um, an interview with a Minneapolis Star Tribune. What's important is to offer the friendship and support. What you need to caution them, churches, is that there's not a price tag on your help. And I think from what I have seen in, in my research, there were very earnest efforts to accommodate religious difference, um, to support refugees in continuing the practice of their, um, their own religion, but it was difficult if refugees uh, had language differences, um, if they couldn't communicate very well. Um, and more critically, it was difficult when people had a set of beliefs and practices that were not immediately legible as religion to the people who were resettling them. So here I think it is where Hmong refugees had a particularly um, difficult situation because they have a set of beliefs and practices that were not immediately legible to um, refugee sponsors as religion in the same way that Vietnamese Buddhists did. So there were a lot of efforts by Lutheran 
um, Presbyterian, Catholic sponsors to help Vietnamese Buddhists be connected with monks, but we didn't see the same degree of accommodation for Hmong refugees simply because there was less knowledge um, and there was less institutional infrastructure to support the practice of Hmong beliefs uh, and practices in the um, early days in the 1970s and 1980s. So I'm going to close with a few reflections on what this might mean for the present. And I'll just emphasize three themes. The first is the theme of power. Um, we know that religion is very powerful. Uh, religion, and here I'm using religion very broadly, but I'm referring to a set of beliefs, practices, institutions, and identities. It's a very powerful source of motivation. Um, it's critical for, for providing material resources and manpower um, to make refugee resettlement possible in the United States. That was true in the 1970s and 80s, the period that I study. It's true now. We also know that religion is present everywhere in refugee resettlement, even if it's explicitly named, not explicitly named and not immediately visible. I mentioned this, um, this point because I think a lot of people don't know that religious institutions play such a critical role in refugee resettlement. The other thing that I think is striking to me is that even voluntary agencies that are connected in one way to religious institutions, either they are affiliated with a big faith-based voluntary agency like um, Church World Service, or they partner with local congregations, which are very clearly religious institutions, they sometimes um, don't talk explicitly about how they have connections to religious institutions that are critical to the implementation of refugee policy. This actually happened in a conversation I had with a voluntary agency here in Indianapolis just a couple of weeks ago, and I was a little bit surprised. Um, so I think it's useful for us to, to think about how religion is present in the work of refugee resettlement, whether or not we see it. Um, and I, I should add one final point on this, uh, which is that religious norms and assumptions, specifically Christian norms and assumptions, often continue to shape uh, how people understand how to do things. And so this is what religious scholars would describe as the idea of the Protestant secular. And finally, um, religion's involvement with refugee resettlement brings a lot of opportunities, but it can also bring perils. Um, sometimes religious conflicts uh, cause sponsorships to break down. Um, so in, in certain ways, by relying on religious institutions to do resettlement work, um, we have to remember that it sometimes came at a cost, and these are not insurmountable things, but worth people being thoughtful and intentional about navigating um, moving forward. And this is particularly true uh, for situations where a Christian church, say, is resettling a group of refugees that do not identify as Christian. So thinking through very carefully what it means to practice pluralism in that particular context is really important. People have taken very different approaches, um, and the reality is it's hard to do. Uh, but I think as much as groups are thinking about how to do that well, uh, the better everyone will, will be moving forward. So I have just talked a lot. I could talk about this for days, um, but I want to know what your questions are and I'm happy to engage in more conversation. Thank you so much. This is great. Um, we have about 15 minutes for questions and so I'll get started here and then I'll also be looking on the live stream for anyone who might have some. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Dwayne Cronkey and I'm a leader of our co-sponsorship of refugees that just started this last summer. So through the summer, we were getting organizing, getting volunteers to do transportation, education, uh, language, uh, and all of the, the practical things that you were talking about. But it's, it's clearly premised upon the overall religious belief that Jesus was open to the, those who were outcast by the society at, the, at that time. And also in a recent sermon by our uh, chief pastor, he had major emphasis on Leviticus and the need to welcome welcome people. Uh, I thought you were going to talk about the immense problems presented by Afghan Afghanistan evacuees. We we told we were working with the Minnesota Council of Churches, and we told them we think we're going to be ready in October 
to take a refugee family. And then in late, late September, we get a phone call, 24 hours notice, are you ready, willing, and able to co-sponsor an Afghan family who are not refugees? And we said yes. And uh, a lot of our team members have been getting them resettled in the apartment that the Council of Churches found and getting that going. And it's in the legal background is exceedingly complicated. And, and <clears throat> for example, a local immigration lawyer who is the president of the local chapter of the Immigration Lawyers of America said uh, <clears throat> there have been over 17,000 applications for humanitarian parole filed with the uh, U.S. agency, and they're here. They don't come with that existing status on their backs. And uh, there are only uh, uh, six adjudicators in the agency to evaluate those. So when, if ever, will those get adjudicated and they'll have that status, which is a very limited status? Are, are you getting involved in these exceedingly complicated issues regarding Afghan evacuees? So I am a historian first. <laughs> and so I've been primarily trying to use the past to inform our decision making in the present. But here's where I would draw parallels between what we know happened in the past and what is happening in the present. Refugee resettlement is really messy because it's very much involved with domestic politics and global politics. And so the, the process that you're describing now, and it's a mess. People don't know what's going on uh, at many levels, and people are just trying to do the best they can. I think it's worth remembering that um, this is very often the case, that people come in with different statuses, uh, that the um, infrastructure isn't there, that these things happen very quickly, that a group like a church community, for example, might mobilize resources to resettle one type of group, and then they might get a phone call the next day and say, actually, you're going to resettle someone who comes from a different country in different circumstances. And so this is not unheard of for sure. Um, I will say, though, and I'm not involved in a lot of the legal work that's happening at the national level, although I am in conversation with um, some of the uh, people who have been. I will say, if I could identify some things that I think are useful for the religious communities to do, in addition to some of the nitty gritty location of housing and employment uh, and organizing that happens that, with congregational sponsorship that you described. Um, in addition to doing that work, it's really useful for religious communities to continue to raise up these big questions of making sure, for example, people who come in with parole status will have access to good support and resources, making sure that this issue, all levels of government, and continuing to change hearts and minds of community members who might still need to be convinced that it's a, a good idea to welcome Afghan um, people in the United States. So uh, I, I would say that that was very powerful and useful in the 1970s. And I think it can be very powerful and useful if people of faith do the same in the current moment. Thank you. I have a question from Ken on the live stream, uh, or a little bit, maybe more of a comment and then a question. He says, to me, refugee resettlement and the reintroduction of previously incarcerated individuals share many of the same needs and challenges. Are you aware of transferable learnings? I'm so glad that theme was brought up. And to be honest, I was reflecting on that as I was reading the opening quotes from the story by Marianne Lund, because she also drew a direct connection between experiences of uh, refugees and prisoners. Um, so in terms of lessons that can be applied, I don't know that much about the work that is done to serve people who are who were recently incarcerated and are re-entering society. But I, I will at least point to the fact that refugees often do describe the experience of living in a refugee camp as one of confinement, but they also have often described the experience of resettlement in the United States as continued confinement. Um, so I'll give one example. Uh, there's a really powerful book called Unsettled by the scholar Eric Tang, 
He wrote about Cambodian refugees who were resettled in the South Bronx, just as it was burning in the 1970s. And he described refugee resettlement for these people uh, as an experience that they saw as continued confinement, um, where they were previously in a camp, but they were continued to be confined in experiences of poverty um, and placed in neighborhoods where they still didn't feel free. If I can think about a more local example, I'm sure many of you have heard of the Hmong American writer Kao Kalia Yang, and she also spoke of confinement, um, experiencing resettlement in the United States as continued, um, continued experience of forces holding her in. That's the language that she used. And so I guess what I would say, at, um, and I don't know about practical, practical things necessarily, but I would say that thinking about um, the, the relationship between incarceration and resettlement is useful. Um, thinking about how people might continue to feel unfreedom, even when they um, have putative freedom is really important. Um, that's another similarity that like once you come to the United States as a refugee, lots of times that's where your hardship can begin. <laughs> because your, your life is hard when you are rebuilding um, and it can feel in its own way confining and painful and difficult. So I would draw continuity there. And one final thing, I'm very interested in institutions and structures and it's interesting to see similarities between um, the significance of religious institution in um, caring for um, people in prison or formerly incarcerated groups and people who are uh, refugees and being resettled. And so um, I, I think that it's just another sphere uh, where we see governments relying heavily on um, private institutions, especially religious institutions, to do the, the types of um, direct human care work that is really, um, really important in order for people to thrive. Thank you. I'm look up. I've got another question here. Good morning. Thank you again. And I'm Jim. And I was kind of struck. You you just touched back on it. So it was a nice closure of the circle. You started your your talk by uh, including the the statement that uh, churches needed to be involved in it, uh, or it, at least non governmental agencies needed to be involved in this work because uh, it was too big for the government to handle. And I said, that's, that throws, everything else is, you know, the government steps in when it's too big uh, for private uh, people to handle. So I'm, I'm thinking of infrastructure and everything else we've been stumbling over the last, uh, the last several months. Uh, that's, those are things that are simply too big to be done on a private scale. So uh, that uh, that bothered me. Number one, we do seem to be uh, able to afford and uh, you know uh, prosecute wars that create refugees and climate change. We reward uh, uh, the uh, uh, fossil fuel industry, and we so we are propagating climate change issues, making climate refugees, uh, and all of these uh, you know essentially become prisoners that are border as you. Uh, recently alluded to. So all of this is interlinked, but largely it's interlinked because of our priorities, our governmental priorities. We have plenty of resources to handle these people. We could we could integrate them very quickly. And one of the difficulties with the government not being the major uh, performer is the lack of a standardization, the insurance of quality. I don't know how many local congregations are able to deal with uh, you know, other other harmful things that could potentially poison their their uh, you know, religious upbringing and whatnot. So I'm, I'm a little skeptical of over involvement of churches. I, I strongly wish the government would be much more involved in providing both resources for the courts, for assimilation, for finances, for uh, everything else. I think there's, there certainly has to be you know, local administration and, and acceptance at the local level, but uh, these things are uh, sadly wanting. Unfortunately, I see the problems with administrations changing every four years. Uh, that you start one great program up, and uh, and pretty soon the uh, the people who control the legislators are going to say, wait, we can't spend that kind of money. We have another war to 
to go win. So anyway, I, 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 that's more, more in the line of comment <laughs> than question. I appreciate your uh, whatever <laughs> reaction to it. I will say I affirm everything you say, and you were not alone in, in this critique and this concern about the very heavy reliance on private institutions basically clean up the human consequences of wars waged by the U.S. government. I mean, that's what it is. The I will also point out that voluntary agencies over the past uh, couple decades have been really frustrated that um, the federal government has not been paying its share of the cost of refugee resettlement work. And that um, over time, over the past three, four decades, um, private agencies, private religious agencies in particular, have been assuming a greater share of the cost. So a government has a weak social safety net that private institutions, especially religious institutions, pick up the slack and function as a buffer in, 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 a, in a situation where people are not uh, getting the care they need from the government. There's a really beautiful book about Somali um, Bantu refugees in Maine that um, discusses this very issue. It's written by an anthropologist named Catherine Bestemann, and it's worth reading for so many different reasons. Um, but she makes this point that um, people who care, so that could be um, a church member of a group that sponsors a refugee, a really well-loved teacher in a local elementary school, they are often a buffer between people who need care, i.e. refugees, poor people, formerly incarcerated people, and a, a government that doesn't care for them. Um, and so it is worth thinking about what that means for our society, not just in the realm of refugee resettlement, but all other ways in which we might expect the government to do a better job of taking care of people and private institutions, especially religious institutions, have to step in in the absence of meaningful resources and support. He's talking next week about reconciliation and forgiveness in the beloved community. We'll see you then.